Okay, so I am going to speak about the Joseph anointing, and then I'm going to open the floor for questions. So if any questions pop up in your minds while I speak, hang on to them. You might want to write them down, and we're going to take roughly the last 15 to 20 minutes as a time for questions. The story of Joseph is the last 14 chapters of the book of Genesis. It's one of the most riveting narratives in the Bible and in ancient world literature in general. It's one of the most well-known stories, still popular today in um, musicals like Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, put to music, put to, to drama. And it's the story of the 11th of Jacob's 12 sons. But it's interesting because he's not the oldest son, Reuben, nor is he the son who will eventually be the ancestor of the kings of Israel, the royal son. Which one is that? That's right. Oh, this is a biblically educated audience. I love it. <laughs> nor is he the son who will be the ancestor of the priestly tribe, who is right. But he's the 11th son, and yet he has more chapters devoted to him than anyone else in the book of Gen Genesis, even the patriarchs, Abraham and Jacob. Even they don't have as many chapters devoted to them as Joseph. It's a very intricate narrative, incredibly well-constructed, rich in character development. And in this unfolding drama, you see a man who is tested in every way, and his character is forged in the furnace of suffering. And not only that, but the, the outcome of what happens with Joseph plays a key role in the unfolding of God's plan because it's because of Joseph that Israel ends up in Egypt. The whole family of Jacob ends up in Egypt, where they're going to stay for 400 years, and eventually God's going to get them out of Egypt in the greatest act of deliverance of the Old Testament, the Exodus. But in order for God to get them out of Egypt, he's got to first get them into Egypt. And that's the Joseph story. But for us as Christians, there's even more to it. Joseph is one of the most remarkable types or prefigurements of Jesus Christ that can be found in the Old Testament. When Jesus, after his resurrection, walked along that road to Emmaus with two of his disciples, it says, beginning with Moses, meaning the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and all the prophets, he interpreted for them everything about him in this, written about him in the scriptures. So that means he began with the book of Genesis. What do you think Jesus talked about? It was a long walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, by the way. <laughs> if, the Emma if Emmaus is, is where um, many archaeologists place it, it's actually 18 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus was on that walk. This was a many-hour Bible study, and no doubt Jesus went into depth in the story of Joseph. And I picture those two disciples with their hearts burning as they began to understand how everything about God's glorious plan for his son was prophesied, hidden, prefigured in the pages of the book of Genesis. So I'm going to unpack this story in itself because simply in itself, it's an incredibly profound and rich story, simply in the literal meaning of Genesis. But then I'm going to show how it points forward to God's whole plan of salvation in Christ. So buckle your seatbelts, because there is, a, there is a lot to cover here. First of all, to really understand the story of Joseph, we've got to understand it within the context of the whole book of Genesis. So hopefully you have a handout here, which shows just the very basic skeleton of the structure of the book of Genesis. Now, in the ancient world, people didn't use chapter divisions or chapter headings or section headings or anything like that. 
but they actually did give clues to how they were organizing a piece of writing, and very often it's by using a formula that gets repeated. And so Genesis has this formula, these are the descendants of, these are the descendants of, these are the descendants of, and the Hebrew word is toledot. Sometimes it's translated the generations of, and it's actually from that word that we get the very name of the book, Genesis, because that was the, the Greek translation of toledot was Genesis. So if you follow the formula as it appears, you see Genesis is actually structured in 10 sections. There are two major parts to the book. The first part of the book is Genesis 1 through 11. Now those are our modern chapter divisions that were put in in the Middle Ages. They weren't what the biblical author put there, but we'll, we'll just use those. Chapters 1 to 11 are what is called the primeval history. The, the story of the origins of the world. And the second half of the book, chapters 12 through 50, is the patriarchal history, the story of the patri patriarchs. Each of those two sections, or those two parts, those two major parts, has five sections. So altogether, we have 10 sections in the book of Genesis. Sometimes they're, they're called two pentads, two sets of five sections. And in this first major part of the book of Genesis, the primeval history, the narrator recounts the, 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 the whole plan of creation, how God created the world in, in six days, followed by the day of rest. And we see God creating humanity and, and God um, placing our first parents in a garden, a place of beauty and life. But then we see how that, the beautiful purpose of God for humanity was torpedoed by sin, which introduced into the world all kinds of disorder and chaos. So that's basically the first part of the book of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11. The first pentad of Genesis is the unraveling of God's beautiful plan for humanity and for creation. Then the second major part of Genesis, chapters 12 through 50, the, the second pentad, begins to tell us how God acts to reverse that tragedy of sin, how he begins to form a chosen people through whom he's going to undo the curse of sin eventually and restore his blessing to the whole human race. Now, at the beginning of the first part, the primeval history, we see God creating Adam and Eve in his image and likeness. So God he creates Adam and Eve, and he, he gives them this blessing. He blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So essentially what God is, is doing there is he's creating human beings as those creatures that will, unlike any other created being on the earth, will reflect the very glory of God, will be God's image, his, a picture of God. And they are to have dominion over the earth. That means they are to be God's royal representatives. In, in other words, they are to be God's vice regents, in a sense, to, to represent God in caring for his creation, reigning over it, bringing it to the order and the perfection that God plans for it. But then, as I said in, in Genesis chapter 3, we see sin come into the world, tempted by the serpent. Our first parents disobey God, drastically undermine the whole plan of God. You know, what, what they were supposed to do by, by subduing the earth and having dominion over the earth was essentially extend the Garden of Eden to the entire earth, 
Make the entire earth a place of beauty, of life, of flourishing, and of intimate communion with God. You know, they walked with God in the cool of the day. So that's what they were to do. But sin undermined that entire plan. They are ejected from the garden. They are exiled from that place of beauty. And from there, the whole thing just snowballs. And in the very next chapter, Genesis 4, you have the first, what? Murder. The fruit of the disobedience of Adam and Eve is even greater sin. Cain's murder of his brother Abel. And so fratricide, the hatred between brothers, is introduced into the human community. And ever since then, there's been war of brother against brother. In fact, really, every murder is a fratricide because we're all children of Adam and Eve. Therefore, we're all brothers and sisters. So that first murder is, is really just emblematic of all hatred and violence ever since then. But in the midst of this unfolding tragedy, there's a key verse, a crucial verse that is so important. It's actually called the proto-gospel, the proto-evangelium. It's, it's the first glimmer of hope that all is not lost, that God actually has a plan to undo this horrible tragedy. It's Genesis 3.15, and you remember this verse, right? It's where God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will crush his heel or bruise his heel. and He will crush your head. That means the, the serpent will give the seed of the woman a damaging blow, but not a fatal blow. But the seed of the woman is going to crush his head, give a fatal blow, the undoing of the serpent and all his works. So that promise of the seed of the woman that God gives right there in Genesis 3, right when he's outlining all of the tragic effects of sin, is a hope that is meant to be kept alive. The seed of the woman. Now because Adam and Eve are presented as kind of royal figures, having dominion over the earth, that's a hint that the seed of the woman is also royal. Because what do you call the son of a king and queen? A king, right? So, so far in Genesis 3.15, it's, it's just a hint. There's going to be a seed of the woman who is going to undo the serpent's damage. So the rest of Genesis 1 through 11 is, is further snowballing effects of sin. Then in Genesis 12, God calls Abraham. Out of the blue, he chooses this one man. And he tells him to leave his homeland, and to go to a land that God will show him. And he begins to form this man. He promises him these great things. He, he promises to make him a great nation. He promises that he's going to have descendants. Later on, he, he expands it. Descendants as the stars of the sky, as the sand of the seashore. He also promises kings will come forth from you. It's supposed to be an echo of the promise of the seed of the woman. Kings will come forth from you. And that his descendants will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So God gives Abraham those promises in Genesis 12, and the rest of the book of Genesis is the adventures of Abraham's family. If you've read Genesis 12 through 50, you know that there is no more dysfunctional family on earth than the family of Abraham. I mean, any kind of sin, any kind of brokenness, disorder, you know, sexual, uh, in terms of violence, in terms of hatred, division, you name it, they've got it. So God's plan seems to keep encountering all these obstacles, all these setbacks, all of these problems. But we have to keep in mind the promise of the seed of the woman. 
who will crush the head of the serpent. Now, let's come to the last section of the pentad of the patriarchal history, the story of Joseph. Joseph is Jacob's great-grandson, I'm sorry, Abraham's great-grandson, Isaac's grandson, Jacob's 11th son, and he's the firstborn of Jacob's beloved. What's, what's uh, the name of Jacob's wife whom he loves dearly? Rachel, Jacob's beloved. He married Leah kind of accidentally, shall we say, <laughs> because he was tricked by their father, Laban, by the father of uh, Leah and Rachel. Rachel is his beloved, and it turns out that she is infertile. And Leah starts giving birth and has child after child after child. Rachel has no children. She prays, and finally, God gives her a child. It's Joseph. So Joseph is something of a miracle baby. And in fact, that's also like his father Jacob and his grandfather Isaac because their moms were also infertile. In fact, all three of the great matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, were all infertile. They were all plagued by this threat against the very continuation of the family of God. All three of them were barren women. And yet in each case, God sovereignly acts to do what human beings couldn't do, to bring a child forth from the barren woman. And the barren woman bears a son. And each time it turns out to be somebody who's absolutely pivotal in the whole plan of God. So, so Joseph is kind of another miracle baby born to the infertile woman. So now we come to the Joseph story proper, which begins in Genesis 37. And this story opens with Joseph as something of a brash, annoying teenager, 17 years old. And it turns out that he's a tattletale on his older brothers because it says he brings his dad, Jacob, an evil report of his brothers. You can imagine how happy that made the brothers. Not coincidentally, a couple of chapters later, Joseph himself is going to be the victim of an evil report. He himself is going to be falsely accused by the wife of Potiphar. There's a theme that runs through the book of Genesis. What you sow is what you reap. Now, we don't know if whatever Joseph, whatever bad report he brought of his brothers was true or false. It doesn't say. In a way, that's not important. But he was saying bad things about his brothers. He was guilty of the sin of detraction. So it starts out with, you know, not a, a very a heartwarming picture of Joseph. To make matters worse, Jacob, dad, shows blatant favoritism. He apparently forgot the lesson of his own parents, because if you read the story of his upbringing, you might remember that his brother Esau was a man's man, and the favorite of his father, Isaac, whereas Jacob was the mama's boy, the favorite of his mom, Rebecca. Jacob was the guy who liked to hang out at home. He's kind of the homeboy, whereas Esau was the guy who liked to go hunting. But the favoritism shown by Isaac and Rebecca is what led to all kinds of animosity and rivalry between Jacob and Esau which led to the breakup of the family. But apparently, Jacob hasn't learned the lesson. Because what does he do? He shows just how happy and proud he is of Joseph by making him a long robe with sleeves, the famous Technicolor dream coat. Now, there's a lot of debate about what exactly the Hebrew words about this robe mean, but uh, it may well have been a kind of royal robe designating Joseph as the heir apparent. In other words, as the successor to Jacob as head of the family. 
In other words, bypassing the first 10. And if so, you can imagine why the first 10 weren't so happy about that either. To make matters even worse, Joseph then has these two grandiose dreams. And as we're going to see, pairs of dreams. Dreams come in two in the whole story of Joseph. So he has these two dreams. And in these dreams, he sees the whole family bowing down to him. Have you ever met a 17-year-old who thinks he's the center of the universe? <laughs> Not very endearing, right? So um, Joseph glibly shares his dreams with his whole family. Hey, guys, I had these dreams. You're going to love them. Let me tell you about this dream. In the first dream, his family members are symbolized by sheaves of wheat. They all bow down to him. In the second dream, his family members are symbolized by the sun, the moon, and the stars. They all bow down to Joseph. And he's like, isn't that great? I'm like, no, I don't think so. It says in, in Genesis um, 37, verse 8, their hatred increased the more and yet more. In Hebrew, it's Yosifu, Yosifu. It's a word play on his name, Yosef. Joseph. His word, his, his name Joseph means increase. Yosef means increase. But the only increase right now is the hatred of his brothers. So there's a real irony in his name. But there's another irony in his dreams. They're going to turn out to be prophetic. Sheaves of wheat? What's going to be the cause of Joseph having this absolutely astronomical rise to power in Egypt, his prediction about the harvests of wheat and then the famine of wheat. Sun, moon, and stars. You know what the Egyptians worshipped as gods? Sun, moon, and stars. His dreams are actually a hint of things to come in more ways than one. But, of course, the brothers don't know that. So one fine day, the brothers are out pasturing their flocks, and Jacob says to Joseph, hey, Joseph, go, go see how your brothers are. You might think it might occur to Jacob. You know, he, he seems to be not very observant. It, it hasn't really uh, occurred to him that they hate his guts. <laughs> Joseph, why don't you go way out into the fields where nobody else is around and see how your brothers are doing. Not a very good idea. In fact, the very words used here when Jacob says, go now, and Joseph says, here I am. If you're paying close attention, it's an echo of another story in Genesis where a father sacrificed his beloved son. The exact same phrases are used in Genesis 22 with the offering of Isaac. So Joseph goes, obe obeying his father, he goes to seek his brothers. He's seeking his brothers. N yes, he's going to geographically locate them. Where, where are they? Where, where have they taken the flocks? But there's, there's more than that. He's seeking his brothers. He's seeking that fraternal love, that communion between brothers that is God's plan, that is the desire, the longing of every human heart. He's seeking that. But by now, their resentment has hardened into murderous hatred. They see him coming at a distance, and they say, let's kill him, and we'll see what's become of his dreams. Well, at that point, the, uh, the firstborn, Reuben, the oldest son, uh, realizes that might not be a very good idea since God has forbidden murder. So instead, let's throw him into a pit. And we'll, you know, just abandon him there in a pit that he can't get out of. That's much better than shedding his blood. <laughs> but Reuben does plan to pull him out later. So they say, okay, that's, that sounds like a good idea. They strip him of his robe. Hold that in your minds. They strip him of his robe. 
And then at the suggestion of the fourth brother, Judah, they see some um, merchants coming by, some Ishmaelite, Ishmaelite traders, and they say, hey, let's sell him to the traders. Let's sell our brother into slavery. So sure enough, they do. Joseph goes into slavery in Egypt. What's going to happen to the entire nation of Israel a little while later? They all end up in slavery in Egypt. What you sow is what you reap. It's not accidental. So Joseph then is going to spend the rest of his life in Egypt. Isn't it interesting that this nation of Egypt, the, 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 what becomes the nemesis of, of Israel, the oppressors of Israel, the epitome of the pagan world, the epitome of those who, who worship idols, who oppress God's people, isn't it interesting that God, in his plan, has his own chosen people, Israel, spend four centuries there? He has his own people get their formation in Egypt. It's also true of Moses. It's also true of Jesus. He spends his toddler years, the son of God himself, spends his toddler years in Egypt, the very last place you'd expect. What about us, children of God? Why doesn't God have us grow up in our faith in paradise? Why doesn't he have us mature in some holy enclave, some kind of spiritual bubble, some kind of greenhouse or hot house where everybody's holy and everybody loves the Lord? Why would he have us mature in this fallen, broken, disordered, idolatrous world? It's his plan. It's in Egypt that the character of Joseph will get forged through his suffering. It's in Egypt that the very son of God will grow in his formative toddler years. It's in Egypt, meaning the world, that we, the children of God, get our formation. Now, meanwhile, back to the brothers. They take Joseph's robe that they stripped off him. They dip it in the blood of a goat, and they bring it back to Joseph, their dad, with crocodile tears. Oh, Joseph. Oh, poor Joseph. He must have been killed by an animal. What's interesting about this, if you look back at the story of Jacob in his upbringing, he deceived his brother out of his father's blessing his brother Esau, how did he do it? Using clothing and the skins of a goat. Clothing and a goat. Now his own sons are deceiving him with clothing and the blood of a goat. What you sow is what you reap. What goes around comes around. But then there's this um, very sad verse where Joseph, where Jacob cries out in anguish, Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Literally, he says, torn, torn is Joseph. Tarof, toraf, Yosef. Tarof, toraf, Yosef. In Hebrew, it's this poetic cry of anguish at losing his beloved son, the firstborn of his beloved Rachel. And he vows to mourn for the rest of his life. There would be a typical period of mourning, sometimes as as long as 30 days. uh, Jacob says, I'm going to mourn for the rest of my life. I'm never going to be happy again. Now, in Genesis 38, there is almost a whiplash effect. you're, You're getting engrossed in this story of Joseph and his brothers. All of a sudden, scene changes, and the spotlight for this one chapter, Genesis 38, is on Judah. And what unfolds here is this sordid affair of Judah's liaison with a prostitute who actually turns out to be his daughter-in-law. This is one of those chapters they don't include in children's Bibles. 
is one of those really R-rated chapters of the Bible. Do you ever wonder why does the Bible have so many R-rated stories? It's because the Bible is not a fairy tale. The Bible is not about a utopia in the realm of ideas. The Bible is the reality of the fallen human race and what God is doing in the very midst of our fallenness and brokenness to heal it. So this is a, it's a very um, disturbing chapter about this, this um, misfortune or this uh, sin in the life of Judah. Why? Why insert this right in the middle of the story of Joseph? Well, there's a very specific reason. The narrator wants you to see the contrast between Joseph and Judah. They both left the family. But Judah left the family seeking fortune and pleasure among the Canaanites, the native inhabitants of the promised land. He wants to go sow his wild oats. He wants to go have his fame and seek his fortune. Joseph leaves against his will because he's been sold as a slave into Egypt. Judah goes seeking a prostitute, seeking earthly pleasure. Joseph, on the other hand, flees temptation when it comes to him. So the, the, the narrator is setting up this contrast. Now, it's also interesting that Judah ends up getting tricked by the woman he thinks is just a prostitute who turns out to be his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and the way she tricks him is with unusual clothing and an agreement about a goat. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> this theme of deception by means of clothing and a goat, it keeps coming back through Genesis. Now, why Judah, why this story here? Remember that God promised Abraham that he would be a great nation and that kings would even descend from him. When we get to the end of Genesis, we read Jacob's blessing of his 12 sons. That's when we find out which son is the father of the royal tribe, the tribe from which the kings will come, beginning with David. And as, as you know, that's Judah, right? It's the fourth son, Judah, who's the father of the royal tribe. And that means that it's through Judah that the promise of the royal seed of the woman will be fulfilled. When Jacob is blessing Judah, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. It's a, it's a prophecy it's kind of moving forward, the prophecy of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is going to come through Judah. The problem is he's unworthy. In chapter 38, he shows himself to be selfish, sexually immoral, unfaithful to God's plan, leaving his family uncaring about the inheritance of, of the family of Abraham in the promised land. He's not worthy. Now, when you get to the end of chapter 38, in a, which I won't describe in detail, in a stunning turn of events, Judah is convicted and he's, he's basically chewed out by the person you would least expect, his own daughter-in-law, Tamar, who is a Canaanite pagan, who is basically haranguing him for his unfaithfulness. So... He is actually humbled. He is actually chastened by a Canaanite. And so when you see him again in the, later in the story of Joseph, Judah is a changed man. He's, he needs to be made worthy of the role that he is going to play in the plan of God. So that's why that seeming digression, which is not a digression at all, but now we come back to the story of Joseph in, in chapter 39. This arrogant, cocky teenager who boasted of family members bowing down to him is now nothing more than a common slave in the house of an Egyptian officer. 
but he's a trustworthy and reliable slave. And eventually he gets put in charge of the whole house of Potiphar. And Potiphar finds that the more he entrusts to this young Hebrew, Joseph, the more the Lord blesses his house for Joseph's sake. It's a hint. God is going to bless not only the house of Potiphar, but the entire nation of Egypt and all the surrounding nations through Joseph. It's a partial fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, through you, I will bless all the families of the earth. However, as Joseph is serving faithfully in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar's wife happens to notice the dashing young Hebrew, and she propositions him. Now, in the ancient world, slaves were considered the property of their masters, including sexual property. Usually men, but that could include the woman who was the, the aristocratic owner. Joseph would surely know that doing sexual favors for this woman could help advance his career very quickly, could be very useful to his future career if he would do sexual favors for her, but he doesn't. He's a model of faithfulness in exile. That's a model Israel will need many centuries later when they themselves will be in exile. In fact, you could say Joseph is a kind of new Adam who's undergoing his own temptation. And where Adam failed and gave in to temptation, Joseph is faithful and he resists temptation. However, Mrs. Potiphar is not impressed with his refusal. She tries to wear him down with repeated seduction. She's relentless. She finally gets annoyed at him. And so she grabs his garment. This is the second time this has happened to Joseph. She grabs his garment. He flees out of the house. The servants come in. She then frames him. She says, look, he, he tried to make love to me. He left his garment with me. She's accusing him of attempted, attempted rape. Joseph gets thrown into prison. His life is becoming a series of unfortunate events. There's a children's book series with that title, A Series of Unfortunate Events, and that's Joseph. Just when you think he's finally hit bottom, it gets worse. And his dreams of glory as a 17-year-old must look like a cruel joke now. Now he's not even a slave, he's a prisoner. And yet, through this chapter that gets really to the bottom of, of Joseph's fortunes, there's this refrain that keeps repeating. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. You could say, sure didn't look like that at the time. I mean, sure looked like God had abandoned him. I mean, by now, this guy has been rejected betrayed by his brothers. He's been trafficked. He's been sexually harassed. He's been falsely accused. He's been wrongly condemned. He's been unjustly incarcerated. He's been abandoned by everyone. The Lord was with Joseph. When we have tough circumstances, like Joseph did, are we tempted to think, God has abandoned me. He easily could have been tempted to think that. But he trusted the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. Is the Lord with you when you hit bottom, when things are as bad as they can get and they get even worse? Yes, the Lord is with you. How do we know? Because God gave his son a name. Emmanuel. The Lord is with us. And we can hold on to that promise. Now, is, is God up there in heaven looking at everything that's going on in the life of Joseph and saying, oh, no, you know, you know first he's thrown into a pit, then he's sold into slavery. Now, now he's accused, he's thrown into prison. Oh, no, what am I going to do? This is really derailing my plan for Joseph. No, God is saying, this is all part of my plan. What I am going to do is not. In fact, Father Morosny said this in the previous workshop. 
God's plan for Joseph is not going to take place in spite of what his brothers did and what the wife of Potiphar did and everybody else did. It's through those very things. It's through those very sins against Joseph, the injustices against Joseph, that God's awesome plan is going to unfold. So Joseph is a model for us. Now, there are two men who end up in prison with Joseph. They are the baker and the butler, or cupbearer, of Pharaoh. Now, these would have been the mo- two of the most important officials in the royal kingdom of, e- of Egypt because these are the two officials who have the very sensitive task of attending to the food and drink of Pharaoh. Now, in a world of palace intrigues and potential assassination attempts, you better make sure that your butler, your cup bearer, and your baker are reliable people, right? That's why they were two of the most important high up people in the royal court. And uh, they had to be known to be above reproach. And, And very often, because of their importance, they were wealthy and very influential. But these two guys somehow had offended, they had managed to offend Pharaoh, and so they were both thrown into prison. And one night, they both have these strange dreams. So here's another pair of dreams, second pair of dreams we've seen. Now, you know, if it had been us, we might say, well, you know, that was the beetle pizza I had last night. (laughs) Egyptians worship beetles. That's why I said beetle. That was the beetle pizza I had last night. But... In ancient Egypt, dreams were taken very seriously as messages from the gods. In fact, there were skilled professionals who would train for years under a master and would be highly paid to interpret dreams because people needed to know what the gods were saying to them through their dreams. But as prisoners, of course, these guys have no way to pay the professional dream interpreters, so it's no wonder that they're troubled. And so Joseph asks them, he sees their downcast faces, what's wrong, guys? And they tell him they've had these strange dreams. And, you know, at this point, Joseph could have said, you know, I've had some dreams myself. I'm not a big believer in dreams anymore. (laughs) They didn't exactly pan out. (laughs) But he didn't say that. He said, do not interpretations belong to God. He puts all the credit where credit is due. He gives the credit to God. He says, if God is speaking through dreams, then he is going to provide the interpretation. Joseph in exile has not forgotten the God of his fathers, the true God, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he invites them to tell their dreams. So the the butler seems really eager to tell his dream, and he says, no, I, in this dream I had some grapes, I, I, I pressed them, got wine, put it in a cup, gave it to Pharaoh. Joseph says, that dream means in three days Pharaoh's going to lift up your head, i.e., you're going to get your job back. You're, he's going to promote you back to your previous position. And uh, by the way, butler, Mr. Cupbearer, please don't forget me when you get out of prison. What's the butler going to do when he gets out of prison? Forget Joseph. Joseph has been sinned against a lot, hasn't he? Even by a fellow prisoner to whom he didn't do any harm. Well, the chief baker now uh, says to himself, well, that sounds pretty good. I think I like this dream interpreter. So uh, I'm going to share my dream. And he shares this dream. I was carrying three big baskets on my head with delicacies for Pharaoh, the best of uh, you know, the, the uh, baked goods that Pharaoh loves. But then the birds came and ate up these delicacies from the basket on my head. Now, for anybody who interprets this in light of the whole scripture, you might keep in mind that whenever we have the image of birds eating, it's a sign of evil. In the parable of the seeds, Jesus says some of the seed fell on the path. And what happened to it? The birds ate it up. That seed of the word of God fell on a hard and rocky path. The birds ate it up. 
So birds eating things up are a symbol of evil. Very often it, it talks about the birds of prey eating corpses after a battle. So, um, you, know, you know, if we had been the chief baker, we might not have been so eager to tell our dream. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a very promising dream. So Joseph says, okay, good to hear your dream. That means that in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head. Now, that's just what he said to the butler, right? But this time he says, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head, meaning decapitate you, hang you. Probably meaning hang you and then decapitate you. That was like the worst way to, to end your life in the world of Egypt because if your body is not intact, you'll never make it into the afterlife. That's why wealthy Egyptians spelt, spent so much time and money and effort on building their tombs and mummifying their bodies. So, I mean, this is pretty ominous, what Joseph says to the baker. But sure enough, it's exactly what happens. Now, two more years pass. Joseph is still languishing in prison. How easy it would be to think now he's really been abandoned by God. You know, I had my one chance for a lucky break with that butler, and apparently he's forgotten me too. So Joseph he must have you know, felt so abandoned and rejected, rejected, but he held on to his hope in God. But now Pharaoh himself has two disturbing dreams. So it's yet another dream pair. And in this, dream, in this uh, uh, pair of dreams, Pharaoh is standing by the Nile, which is the source of the entire economy of Egypt, because the annual flooding of the Nile River irrigates and fertilizes the entire Nile River Valley, which brings forth the crops that um, both feed the, uh, the animals, of the livestock of Egypt, and also bring forth the, the grain that feeds Egypt. So the Nile is really the, 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 um, the umbilical cord. The, it's, it's the lifeline of the whole nation of Egypt. And in this dream, Pharaoh sees seven sleek, fat cows rise up from the Nile. That sounds like Egypt's uh, wonderfully prosperous economy. But then seven gaunt, thin cows rise up from the Nile and eat up the first seven fat ones. And then the, in the second dream, it's kind of the same thing in a different way. Seven plump ears of grain get eaten up by seven thin, blighted ears of grain. Well, Pharaoh, uh, he tells his dream. None of his interpreters can figure out what the dreams mean, uh, possibly because they don't want to say anything that wouldn't puff up Pharaoh's ego. But for whatever reason, nobody can interpret it. The butler is suddenly cured of amnesia. Oh, there was this guy in prison, and he turned out to have a 100% track record of accuracy in interpreting dreams. Just remembered it. Pharaoh says, get him up here right now. He tells his dream, his dreams, Joseph interprets the dreams, and then he goes on to say, here's what you should do about it. He not only gives the, the meaning of the dreams, he says, here is how you apply the dreams. God is, he's giving you as the ruler of the nation a prophetic warning of what's going to happen. There are going to be seven years of incredible bounty, of plenty, followed by seven years of devastating famine. The seven years of plenty are to help you get ready for the years of famine. Here's how you should organize things to store up the grain. And so Pharaoh says, I like this guy. <laughs> he, he sounds compelling. He convinces me. And here we come to a, a line that is often overlooked, but it's really a high point of the Joseph story. Genesis 41, verse 38. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? In whom is the Spirit of God? Now, in Pharaoh's mind, that simply means I see that this guy has he's, something supernatural is going on. Like the gods are speaking through him. 
But for us as readers of Genesis, and for the ancient Jews as readers of Genesis, they would remember the Spirit of God has been mentioned only one other time in the entire book. At creation, the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. The Spirit of God was bringing order into chaos. And so without even realizing it, Pharaoh is saying something of capital importance about Joseph. This is a man in whom the very spirit of the living God, the creator God, dwells. Why? Not just because he's able to interpret these dreams, but because he has held on to faithful trust in the Lord God, even in his time of trial, in repeated, devastating trial after trial, he has remained faithful to God while he was humbled and brought very low. And because of that, he's going to be raised up high. And so to say, this is the man in whom it is the Spirit of God is the Joseph anointing. And that Joseph anointing to be one in whom the very Spirit of God dwells is for every Christian. Because what happened at Pentecost and what happened to you on the day of your baptism and your confirmation, the Spirit of God came to dwell in you so that you can live a life of fidelity to God as Joseph did. Well, Pharaoh is so impressed, he raises up Joseph on the spot to second in command of the whole nation of Egypt. In other words, he's prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. Grand vizier is also a, a term that is used. Pharaoh decrees every knee is going to bow before Joseph. And he puts on him a gold chain and he gives him a uh, his, his signet ring, the ring of royalty, and he gives him clothing of fine linen, that linen of ancient Egypt. I mean, even today, Egyptian linen is uh, you know, high quality, but you can even see it in ancient painting, paintings. It's so fine, it's almost transparent. So he, he clothes Joseph, this guy who's been stripped of his clothing twice, is now clothed in the linen of royalty. And as he goes through Egypt, every knee bows before him. And so, sure enough, the dreams come true, the seven years of plenty, followed by the seven years of famine. Joseph organizes all this storage of grain during the seven years of plenty. And Egypt is saved from famine. And not only Egypt, but the surrounding nations begin to come to Egypt to buy grain. The, the entire world of the ancient Near East is saved from famine. And again, it's a beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. But now we come back to the other 11 brothers, the 10 older brothers and the youngest brother, Benjamin. Back in the land of Canaan, back on the family farm, they're feeling the effects of the famine themselves. Actually, I, su I shouldn't say farm. They're not really farming. They're living in tents. But they're feeling the effects of famine, and their animals are going hungry, and things are not good. And so Joseph sends his sons to go to Egypt. You know, look, sons, we're, uh, we're not going to survive here, uh, but I've heard there's plenty of grain in Egypt. Go buy grain for us. They get to Egypt, and they are brought into the presence of the prime minister, the grand vizier of Egypt, a man of incredible royal stature. And what do they do? They bow to the ground before him three times. Way back when Joseph was recounting his dreams, the word bow was used three times. And it's exactly what's fulfilled here. They bow to the ground before him three times having no idea who he is, of course. What does Joseph do? He arrests them. 
He accuses them of being spies. Why would he do that? Is is Joseph getting his, his bitter revenge on his brothers? No, it may look like that. But this is his plan to test them. Joseph is going to find out if his brothers have changed since that terrible day many years ago when they sold him into slavery. So they, they, they tell Joseph, we're all sons of, of one man. There were 12 of us, but we lost one. Oh, it was such a tragedy. There's still one other, he, the youngest, but he's back home with dad in, in the land of Canaan. Joseph says, you're lying. And so I, I, I don't believe you. If you want to prove that you're telling the truth, I'm going to bind up one of you. So he binds up Simeon. He puts Simeon in, in a prison, and he says, In order to see if you're telling the truth, I want you to go back to Canaan and come back here with that youngest brother you mentioned. And then I'll know that you were telling the truth and you're not spies. And they they begin trembling and they start saying to themselves, this is happening because of what we did to our brother Joseph. Little do they know. They just think it's divine punishment. Little do they know whom they're speaking to. So then, as they're about to leave, he, Joseph took, takes the money that they paid for their grain, and he secretly puts it back in their sacks. Looks like he's framing them for a crime. Why would he do that? Well, think about this. When they get home and they open their sacks and they find all this money, they're going to have lots of money but a missing brother. Does that sound like anything that happened in the past? He's reminding them. He's recreating the scene. He's reminding them of the sin that they had committed against their brother Joseph. Well, they get home, and they say, "Um, Dad, um, Simeon is still there in Egypt. Um, uh, And Joseph is like, can you explain to me why one brother is still in Egypt? They're like, um... (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, Dad. <laughs> and they tell the story. And Joseph says, you've bereaved me of my children. Again, it's an irony. Little does Jacob know how true that is. And they say, well, you know, we can't, we can't get Simeon back until we bring uh, Benjamin back to Egypt. And th- that way the prime minister will know that we were telling the truth and we're not spies. Jacob says, absolutely no way. I've lost one son of Rachel. I am not losing the other son of Rachel, my youngest son. No way you're taking Benjamin back to Egypt. Well, time passes and time passes, and the famine is worse, and now the family is in danger of starvation. Judah says, Dad, we got to go. We're going to starve. And and, Dad's, and Jacob says, not with, not with Benjamin. You're not bringing Ben. Dad, we can't go back into the presence of this prime minister without Benjamin. Judah says, I will offer myself as surety. I myself will be the guarantee. We will bring Benjamin back in safety, along with with Simeon. Jacob says, okay, I don't like it, but okay. He gives them lots of valuable goods. He gives them balm, honey, myrrh, gum, and double the money to take back to this prime minister of Egypt. But it's interesting Because now the brothers are heading to Egypt in a caravan with a son of Rachel and gum, balm, myrrh, and other valuable goods. It's exactly the way Joseph had gone into Egypt on a caravan bringing those exact same goods. It's a recreation of the scene. Well, they get back to Egypt. They produce Benjamin. They said, see, we weren't lying. Joseph hosts them. The the, the prime minister hosts them at a meal. And amazingly, he lines up the brothers at table in their exact order of birth. And they're thinking, whoa, this guy's like psychic. Like, whoa, he's got, you know, supernatural information from the gods. (laughs) Little do they know. Then Joseph he gives them all their portions at a you know fine dining in the, the royal house of Pharaoh. He gives Benjamin 
the one who's his, the, his full brother, five times the portion he gives all the others. Why is he doing that? Just to show favoritism like his father did and his grandfather did? No, he's testing them. Are you still jealous, brothers, as you were before? Are you still envious at the blessing of another brother? Or have you changed? He restores Simeon to them. He lets them go in peace. But this time he does something else. He hides his own silver cup in the sack of Benjamin. And then he has his steward follow the caravan as they're heading home to Canaan. And the steward says, we have discovered that one of you has stolen the silver cup of the prime minister. No, no, we didn't do that. You can search our sacks. We would never do that. The sacks are searched. The cup is found in Benjamin's sack. They rend their clothes and return to the city. All right, Joseph, we're your slave. Or th no, they don't call him Joseph. They don't know he's Joseph. All right, Prime Minister, we're your slaves. No, only the guilty one will be my slave. The rest of you can go free. Here we come to a crucial moment in the story. Will they once again abandon a brother to slavery in Egypt, a son of Rachel, or have they changed? At this point is, is really the high point of the whole story. Judah, the fourth son, the very one who had first proposed, let's sell him into slavery to that caravan of merchants, Judah has been humbled. He's been humbled by that experience with Tamar, and he's been humbled by the, the whole unfolding thing going on now with the famine. And he tells this grand prime minister, look, if we leave Benjamin here as your slave, our father will die of sorrow. We will bring his gray ha hairs down to the grave in sorrow. We can't do that. Let me stay as your slave in his place. Wow. What a radical transformation. Instead of, let's get rid of our brother that we don't like. Let's sell him into slavery. Let me suffer in place of my brother. Let me pay the price, be the surety, so that my brother can go free. Judah is a changed man. And his speech in Genesis 44 is one of the most moving passages in the entire Bible. When you read the speech of Judah to the prime minister of Egypt, whom he doesn't yet know the identity of, you cannot but hear the heart of Jesus. Let my brothers and my sisters go free and let me pay the price in their place. Judah has finally become prepared, become worthy of his role as the father of the royal tribe from whom will come the seed of the woman. Now, when Judah finishes that speech, Joseph can't contain himself anymore. He shouts to his servants, everybody leave the room. And he's weeping so loud the Egyptians hear him. And he reveals himself to his brothers. I am Joseph, your brother. You can imagine how stunned they are. Up to now, he's been speaking through an interpreter. They're speaking Hebrew. He's speaking Egyptian through an interpreter. They have no idea. You can imagine the deer in the headlights. Look, <laughs> it must have taken them some time to, to let it register. You're Joseph, our brother. And you can imagine the very next thought is, uh-oh, <laughs> We're in trouble. And what does Joseph do? He embraces them. 
He kisses them. He weeps and weeps and weeps, and he offers them pardon. And then Joseph says to them at the beginning of chapter 45, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What, Joseph? I thought hateful and jealous, angry brothers sold you here. And greedy merchants brought you here. God sent me. No matter what it looks like on the surface, God is at work bringing about his plan for those who trust him. God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. What an incredible act of forgiveness. From the very time of the fall, when God cursed the ground, he didn't curse Adam and Eve, but he cursed the ground, thorns and thistles, through thorns and thistles will the ground bear fruit. Famine has threatened the very survival of God's people. In fact, way back in Genesis 12, Abraham himself had to go to Egypt because of famine. So famine is continually threatening God's people. Joseph, in time of famine, has preserved the life of God's people so that the family could continue until the promise of the royal seed is fulfilled. So God, Joseph has provided bread for a hungry people, not only the family of Jacob, but Egypt and all the surrounding nations. At the same time, since the fall and the, the murder of Abel by Cain, brotherly hatred, brotherly conflict, tensions in the family have plagued the covenant family of Abraham from generation to generation. By his forgiveness, Joseph reverses that. He reconciles with his brothers. Later on in chapter 50, after Jacob is brought to Egypt with the brothers and, and then Jacob dies, the brothers are thinking, uh-oh, you know, now he's going to get his chance and he, he's wanted to kill us all along. Now he's going to kill us because dad is dead. Joseph says to them, fear not. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So Joseph is undoing the threat of famine and he is undoing the brotherly hatred that has plagued God's people through the generations. So through Joseph, you see God beginning to fulfill his promise to undo the damage brought by the serpent, to reverse the trajectory of evil that began with the fall. And then as the story concludes, Joseph, with the enthusiastic agreement of Pharaoh, invites the whole clan to relocate to Egypt to be provided for, to survive the famine. Pharaoh gives them the best of the land, Goshen, the, the most uh, fertile part of Egypt. And, and then it says, um, thus Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Does that remind you of something way back in Genesis 1? the very blessing that God gave Adam and Eve and the commission God gave them, be fruitful and multiply. It was a blessing and a commission. And then with Abraham, it became a promise. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to make you fruitful. But now for the first time, it becomes a reality. Now God's people are fruitful 
and they multiply. So Joseph, who started off possibly not even being conceived because his mother was barren, becomes a miracle baby of the infertile woman and becomes a means by which the threat of famine and starvation is, is removed and the fratricide and the brotherly conflict is reversed, Joseph has become a model or a type of the royal seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. And then, in this interesting detail, it says, Joseph gave festal garments to all his brothers. Festal garments. Have you noticed how clothing has run through the story? What's the very thing that the very first thing that happened after the fall of Adam and Eve? They looked down and noticed that they were naked. Clothing symbolizes dignity, status. Nakedness symbolizes the shame of sin. Joseph was clothed in a royal robe by his father Jacob, the long robe with sleeves. But then he was disrobed, stripped of his robe by his brothers. Then he was again stripped of his robe by the wife of Potiphar. So he he hit bottom. But then he was clothed in royal linen by Pharaoh. But the end of it is, is not just Joseph having that royal clothing. He gives his brothers festal garments. So he shares with them the royal festal celebratory clothing that he himself has received. Is anybody seeing ways that this points forward to the fulfillment of God's plan? At the very end of Genesis, we have, we have the list of the descendants of Jacob who come to Egypt when the whole clan moves there. Seventy descendants already by that time. It's alluding to the 70 nations of the world that were listed in Genesis chapter 10, hinting at the vocation of the family of Abraham to restore all the nations of the world to God's blessing. Now, in light of the whole book of Genesis, we can see more clearly how Joseph, even though he's not the royal son, Judah, or the priestly son, Levi, how in his life he models what the ideal ruler looks like. The royal seed of the woman promised by God who would crush the head of the serpent. Joseph typifies it in his own life. When we've seen that, then we can see more clearly how Joseph points forward to the true royal seed of the woman. Just think of this, and I'll end with this. Think of another son who was beloved of his father, envied by his brothers, particularly his fellow Jews, who foretold his future glory, who was sent out by his father to seek his brothers until he found them, who was conspired against, betrayed by those closest to him, stripped of his robe. And if you think of the robe as a symbol of royal dignity, you could say twice stripped of his divine royal dignity, first by becoming incarnate, as a mere human being, and secondly, by being obedient even to death on a cross, twice emptied of self, who was cast down into a pit, sold for pieces of silver, who became a servant, who was faithful to the Lord in humiliation and trial. But the Lord was with him, a son who was tempted and did not sin, who was falsely accused, who foretold the future, 
in whom the Spirit of God dwells. And every knee will bow before him and confess his name, who was 30 years old when he began his life's work. Like Joseph, 30 years old when he began in the court of Pharaoh who was raised to high honor and clothed in royal garments, the garments of divine glory, who forgave his brothers and therefore reversed the very curse of Cain and the curse of sin, who preserved life by giving bread to a starving world, the bread that is himself who restored God's original blessing to the human race and who has given festal garments, the, the garments of salvation to all his brothers and sisters and has become a savior to the whole world. Jesus is the new Joseph and his Joseph anointing is for all of us. Amen.